Hiding behind Wuwang Hill and tucked away behind a small corner of Qingzhe, you will find one of Genshin's early bosses named Rodea, an oceanid who has this interesting opening line. An assassin from our homeland, or a fool who trespasses upon the waters of Qingzhe. Each time I would gather materials from Mona, Child, or Barbara, I would always wonder what she meant. What was her homeland like? And why on earth would they send an assassin after her? How did she get here, to the waters of Qingzhe? Did somebody lead her here for her protection? And who were they? Aside from the question that relates to her homeland, none of these others have yet to be answered. And that's honestly a shame. I genuinely was looking forward to Fontaine, to see how they would judge the Traveler as well as the Archons of Tevat, to see this country even judge Celestia high above the heavens, and to finally see this massive story slowly unfold. Fontaine marks the halfway point in this current story saga, but I suppose we can get into that later. For now, let's return to our Traveler and Paimon who, yet again, decide to take a trip to the next region randomly. If any of you have been following this channel, you will know this was a critique from the last video. The story, for some reason, doesn't want a natural lead into the next region. There's no buildup, no reason whatsoever why we randomly decided to come here. What's the story's reason for waiting so long? Yes, I know the in-game reason why we waited so long, but what's the story's excuse? We are on a journey to find our sibling, and that would seem like it would be a pressing matter. We need to journey through all of Tefat and discover what happened. Let me repeat myself again. Despite my criticisms against Inazuma, at least it had a reasonable excuse as to why we just couldn't get up and go there. We had to find a ride that would take us through the storm that had been covering the islands. It made logical sense. Here though, in Fontaine, we've just been waiting around doing random commissions instead of completing our mission to travel across to that. Like we're supposed to. At least that's supposed to be our goal. All that aside, we make our way to Fontaine and are immediately introduced to the magician Linny and his sister Lynette. Upon on meeting Lynette, she says the most out of place foreshadowing I've ever heard in this game. The water is gradually swallowing our memories. It won't be long before it swallows us. Aren't you being a little harsh? Well, perhaps, but was there really no way to go about this? In other stories, creators will go out of their way to create natural dialogue that will go along with exposition. Because if they don't, it feels incredibly out of place when characters just randomly exposit information. To be fair though, the magician's introduction isn't too terrible compared to some other characters. It makes sense for them to be walking around the port advertising their magic show. Following this exchange, the Traveler tells Lenny that he would like to meet the Hydro Archon. The Magician agrees and says after he takes care of a few things, he will take them to the Opera House to meet with Farina. But before the group begins to leave, she just appears, as if following her cue to come on stage. I even joked about this in one of my YouTube shorts. I like how convenient it is, especially after how long we had to wait to meet with Raiden Shogun. But I also don't like how convenient it is. At first it was nice, but it's a little too convenient. Almost as if she was waiting for us the whole time. Farina claims that her powers as a god allowed her to do this, but I doubt it. Even if you are aware of the heavy spoiler, it still makes little sense. She accuses our emergency food of the crime of being the most annoying side character in the stupid game. I mean to say that she accuses Paimon of being an illegal item. Lenny is able to smooth talk our way out of it and endears to his character and Farina takes her leave. Following this major encounter, the Traveler reunites with an old acquaintance, the reporter from this team, Bert, Charlotte. When talking about the many problems of Genshin, people often bring up the fact that it's a gacha game. And one of the many flaws of being a gacha game is having to randomly introduce characters into the story. Characters like Hewla show up randomly in the story even though Logically, she really should have been there from the beginning. Charlotte represents how Genshin Impact should introduce its characters. Our cool reporter had shown up a couple patches earlier in 3.7 and gave the audience a first glimpse into the future of playable characters in Fontaine. While this still has its issues, this is probably the best way to introduce future characters. Don't have them pop up randomly, but have them pop in early on. This game is full of travelers and adventurers, so it makes sense that we would run into a few characters from different regions. Or if they show up late, be sure to mention them earlier on in the story and give them some build up to their character. Not only this, but Charlotte also sets a good example for good exposition. I criticized the game just moments ago when it seemed out of place that Lynette was talking about the prophecy. Here, when Charlotte's talking about the mysterious disappearances case, it makes more sense given the fact that she's a reporter. Oh, I just remembered! I've been following a case lately. You mean the serial disappearances of young women case. 
It's not perfect, but I'll take it. Once we part ways with Charlotte, Lenny takes the Traveler to his home and we are introduced to another sibling named Fremine. Then it starts to rain and we are given this bit about foreshadowing. We don't know where the dragon went. Every time it weeps, the skies will cloud up and pour out rain. And then we are given an errand to run for Lenny at the blacksmith's. There we run into child. Wait, again? I know it's Genshin's civic duty to remind the player base that this character still exists, but they could have just picked a different harbinger. Remember in Yulon's story quest when Regrader was brought up? Casually? Why not pick someone like him? It would be nice to meet the other Harbingers. And or why not pick someone like Arlecchino for reasons that I will mention later in the video. It just feels like the writers forgot about some of the characters they introduced. Oh, and speaking of forgetting, I forgot that this happens. Huh? Huh, that was weird. Child randomly can't use his vision abilities. Do we ever get an answer as to why this happened? If my memory is correct, it's nothing too important. I'll make a note of that when it comes up later. See, when this first came up, I initially thought it had something to do with Hydro Visions specifically, but it seemingly happens just because Child is at odds with himself. This kind of thing is weird. Before departing, Child mentions his time in the Abyss, as well as his master, Skirk. And let me take this time for once to praise Genjin Impact. It's actually putting a major story element into the main quests? Wow, it only took four years. And so, we depart to the Opera House. Escorted by a melusine named Elfan, who desperately needs a vacation, and wait by the fountain for Lynette to arrive. And that's when the traveler starts to hear voices. However, Lynette arrives, and the three of them head off to the magic show, and this is where chapter 4 truly begins. As Lenny's magic show is underway, something goes wrong. One of his assistants is murdered during the performance. The blame is put on Lenny by Farina and the Traveler is left to discover what really happened. Firstly, this would make us a detective, not an attorney. Second, I love watching detective stories, but I hate playing them. I always feel stressed whenever I have to play through this type of game. Then again, Genshin holds your hand through most of it. Since this is part of the main story, you can't actually lose the case. When the Traveler investigates further, they meet someone named Navia. She represents a group called the Spina di Rizula and offers to help us in our endeavor to save Lenny. Navia says that she has a personal connection to the mysterious disappearances case and states that she doesn't agree with Hydro Archon. And so, with Navia's help moving forward, the trial of the Opera Nicles is underway. I have a few problems with this aspect of the story. To be fair though, I do think there are some good parts to this trial. And they also highlight the messiness of Fontaine's justice system. But this trial is bizarre. I feel like the problem with Genshin Impact's story overall is put on full display here in this one section. It's my personal belief that the writers have far more ambitious plans for the story than the producers would allow them to spend on it. If the story had a little bit more time to cook in the oven, I think it could have been great. As it is though, it's kind of clunky. First off, how is the Traveler and Paimon simply allowed to look over evidence? The two of them are just kind of thrust into the defense attorney role without any argument, and they aren't detectives. Second, I find it incredibly hard to believe that a police officer doesn't bother looking over everything. Given how actual detective work plays out in our real world, I find it hard to believe that not one officer looked over the evidence that was presented to them. Again though, I understand that it's part of the problem with Fontaine's justice system in this region. And Finally, the water from that primordial sea is introduced almost out of nowhere and it's the perfect piece of evidence to save the case. In any other detective story, most of the time the evidence just doesn't fall out of the sky. Or if it does, it appears that way and it's actually been there the whole time. Look here, we've gift dropped you the perfect get out of jail free card. I would have been fine if there was some sort of setup introducing the water from that primordial sea, but there wasn't. Lenny's magic show doesn't count. He could have used a myriad of different things to showcase Lynette's disappearance. In fact, that could have been it. Lynette's disappearance could have sparked a discussion between Lenny and the Traveler as to how the trick was done. And that's how you would introduce the water from the primordial sea. As it stands, this trial feels like it's ripping off some cheesy movie where the protagonist is saved at the last minute by a surprise witness who we've never met before. However, to be fair to Genshin, it has happened before in media. And yes, the primordial seawater is planted on Linny in order to frame him, but it lasts for all of five seconds. And so Linny is declared innocent, this random guard who tried to frame our magician pulls a wicked witch of the west, and we are left with this remaining puzzle of the primordial sea. Now, am I forgetting anything? Tell me, aren't you and
and Lynette actually from the House of the Hearth? Uh Well, I suppose now is a good a time as any to segue into that specific topic. The Fatui, at one point in time, were antagonists to the overall story. At the start of the game, the Fatui had made their presence known in Mondstadt, and the Knights of Vivonius had made it a point to tell the Traveler that their group wasn't all that welcome. The Fatui only solidified this position when they attacked Venti at the end of the quest into the Gnosis. At the start of Chapter 2, we come across another Fatui member named Child, the 11th Harbinger. At first, he seems rather cordial. But but as the story of the second chapter unfolds, we slowly realize that he's using us to get into the Golden House. What have I missed? They spoke of the Qixing taking the Golden House. Once the climax of this part of the story begins, we are confronted by Tartaglia. Our child, he's got multiple names. A fight ensues at the Golden House and we end up defeating him. However, after this, something bizarre happens. We magically become friends with the 11th Harbinger. Okay. Upon going over the materials for this video, I completely forgot Child was actually a monster. This man was willing to murder thousands of people just to get his way. It's only towards the end of the quest that we see him again and he shrugs all this off like we're just old friends. Even so, after doing his character quest, I can still see how we could become allies. However, in my opinion, this barely works. Yes, theoretically you can fit it in to multiple story quests sprinkled throughout the game, and when they make the character more likable, it kinda softens the blow of genocide. So long as this doesn't happen again, we should be fine. It happens again. And again. And again. It was at this point some of my commenters, as well as some other YouTubers, realized WiiUverse has a problem with making villains. In other video games, you can play as the villain in plenty of fighting games that actually make you play as the antagonists when you unlock them at the end of the story. So what did WiiUverse do? They made their villainous group completely neutral. Sure, Skarmus threatened Traveler, Mona, and Fischl, but now he's just an angry boy. The Red Shogun was a tyrant that ruled over her country, but now she's just a neat who just needs to get some more fresh air, that's all. You know, it was fun in the beginning when theory crafters were making videos going over the reasons why Shnejnaya and the Fitui were not actually bad guys. Because back then, we actually thought they were bad guys. <sighs> what was it talking about again? I feel like I veered off into some kind of tangent. Oh right, Linny. So, partway through the trial, it's discovered that Linny and his sister Lynette are working for the Fitui, as part of the House of the Hearth. The Traveler is completely dumbfounded and angry that the two of them would do this. I can't tell you why, that is, because it confuses even me. In my first ever Genshin video, I talked about Ayaka asking the Travelers for help and the Traveler just turning them down, and then I was confused. This is why. It feels out of character. The Traveler up to this point has always been a helpful person to anybody that came across their path. This is wild for me to hear that they would refuse to help Ayaka with the problem with Inazuma. The story could have easily written in dialogue for the Traveler that stated that they didn't want to become involved because it might make them an enemy of the Raiden Shogun who they were trying to get in contact with. But the game didn't write this in. You, the player, have to make your own judgment as to why the Traveler didn't decide to help. We as players shouldn't have to make up our own reasoning as to why the main character acts the way they do. That's the job of the writers of this game to do so. So, going back to Lynette and Linny, it doesn't make any sense. First of all, these two have shown no hostility towards us, but the game wants us to act like they're enemies. Second of all, we're friends with the Fatui Harbinger. As I mentioned earlier, this could have worked with someone like, oh I don't know, Arlecchino right off the bat. Where to start? We trusted you two. We based our entire reasoning on the assumption that you weren't bad guys. But the Harbinger we're interacting with was somebody that we knew and were pretty buddy buddy with. If you wish to drown together with the people of Nira, you're free to stay and enjoy the show. Yeah, how dare you tell us you're Fatui? We can't trust you anymore. This game wants to have its cake and eat it too. But it also forgets that people like me exist who remember these details. You can either make the Fatui villains, or you don't. I don't believe for a second that the Traveler or Paimon would believe Lenny or Lynette are actually bad guys. Anyways, let's continue to the second act. Now that we have finished with Lenny's trial, and seemingly opened up an old cold case with the mysterious disappearances, the Traveler decides to take a break and spend time with Navia and relax for a bit. But unfortunately for everyone else, the case is not done with the Traveler. What began as a small case to defend our magician friend has slowly turned into a conspiracy. 
As we take our leave from dinner that Navia treated us to, the Traveler and Paimon are ambushed by Gardamax. The Traveler is saved by Navia as well as Clorand later on. During this encounter, Navia dismisses Clorand. As it turns out, Clorand is responsible for Navia's father's death. After this ordeal, the Traveler and Navia take their time and rest until the next day to visit Nouvellet. And finally, it's here that I'm going to take time out of my day and praise Genshin Impact. One of the many, many, many problems of this game is that it can't seem to have good animations for its characters. As a result, when watching these cutscenes, the story beats often feel emotionless. And when these developers are reusing, reducing, and recycling these animations, it's very boring to watch. Look at how happy Klee is! She's so happy she could burst. Wait, what's this? Are those tears? Now the emotion of this scene doesn't solely have to rely on the back of the actress to carry its weight. Oh brother, this guy stinks! Yes, I know, I can hear you in the back. It's just a small improvement. But I can't be an angry asshole all of the time, now can I? Anyways, our mystery continues to grow. Nouvellet, the Chief Justice, has no clue who Vache is. Vache, up until this point, has been name dropped a few times. He's the person that's been mentioned constantly in the Traveler's mind. Whenever they hear voices, this person is always calling out to Vache. There is no record of him. And Nouvellet, who's lived for hundreds of years, maybe even a thousand years, doesn't recognize him. So it's up to the Traveler and Navia to discover the truth behind the mysterious disappearances case. With Navia behind us, as her father was connected to the case several years ago, we set out to discover the truth, no matter the cost. And through a series of twists and turns, we finally uncover the truth. An old family friend of Navia's named Marcel is responsible. Because, as it turns out, he's actually Vache, the man responsible for the missing women. And so he's brought to justice and met with an agonizing end. That, again, should have been animated more like this. But I digress. Also, something interesting happens. Tartaglia has been found guilty despite moments ago finding the actual guilty party. He tries resisting in this really cool trailer shot and is immediately subdued by a new let. It's here that the story kind of comes to a close. We ask Nouvellet about her sibling and the other various questions that we ask at the end of the story's run. But here's the thing, the story isn't over here. In fact, we're only halfway through. A few days later, the Traveler and Paimon are called into Nouvellet's office to discuss something with him. Apparently, he and Farina had a conversation with Arlecchino, another harbinger, regarding Tartaglia and his release. Nouvellet can't release him, and she also can't check up on his condition. Child has been taken to the Fortress of Meripede, Fontaine's impenetrable and escapable prison located at the bottom of the sea. And so Nouvellet takes it upon himself to get a third party to do it. Man, do I really wish I had a couple of suckers who are completely new and neutral to Fontaine. Oh hi Traveler! And so it was that we the players were finally introduced to a new section of the game, the Fortress of Meripede. As we were taken on a tour of the facility by essentially the Fortress's warden, Risley, something starts to feel off. As we learn the ins and outs of the fortress, it seems rather slow going. And after finishing a meal with him, we set off and begin our new life as a prisoner of the fortress. But first, allow me to give some praise to this part of the story before I fully dive into critique. To the stars shining into the abyss does introduce a few colorful characters, as well as introducing a new locale in the series. I actually really enjoyed this location despite the fact that I haven't revisited it since my initial playthrough. Meripede is somewhat nostalgic and comforting, while oddly enough, simultaneously Simultaneously being claustrophobic and restricting. Its iron walls I would often explore and try to take the long way around during this quest just to see every inch of the fortress. It's everything I wanted and more from the prison of Fontaine with the steampunk aesthetic. But this is where my praise for this portion of the story ends. As we try and continue to investigate, all we can do is work and get introduced to the local activities that surround the fortress. We go to work, ask questions, and go to sleep. And that sinking feeling starts to set in. Something's not right. Have any of you ever watched long-running anime like Dragon Ball Z and Naruto? In Dragon Ball Z, the main character Goku finds his way to King Kai after Goku's death in order to train to become stronger to defeat the Saiyans that are coming to invade his planet. 
and so he races along Snake Way to reach King Kai. At some point during the anime, he slips off and falls down into hell of all places. Once there, Goku must find his way back up to continue his journey. In Naruto, Team 7 find themselves helping out a young man by the name of Idate from the land of T. And Naruto and his friends have been hired to be bodyguards. When watching these for the first times, you may think nothing of them. Still, however, something might feel off. Because something is off. These stories are both considered filler. When the production of an anime catches up with the original source material of the manga, animators back in the day have to create random storylines to fill in story gaps so that the show can continue continue to air. This is what To the Stars Shining in the Abyss feels like. It feels like filler. From doing our daily work, to placing our bets in the fighting ring, it all feels like useless fluff. All we're doing is drifting off our original course. And the final nail in the coffin? Tartaglia isn't here. He left some time ago. That's right, your harbinger boyfriend, he's in another castle. Well, at least we're done with the fortress for now, so we can finally move on to the outside world. Now that we know the child is no longer here. Wait, what? There's more? An hour and a half! So, we spent this remaining time trying to find the secret behind the Fortress of Meripede, and it's a boat. Great. So you're telling me I spent an hour and a half on this big secret that was just Noah's Ark? Cool! In truth, the actual secret of the fortress is that it's a seal to the opening of the Primordial Sea. I guess I'll give it a brownie point. It is this really cool scene with Nouvellet. And finally, after all is said and done, we are finally released from prison and we are free from the fortress. Thank God. I still have massive problems with how the story ends and how it overall impacts the main plot of Genshin. That being said, a lot of people seem to think that this is where Genshin Impact story has reached its peak. To be honest, I don't fully agree. But Fontaine is a massive improvement. In order to explain this, I need to skip over a certain part I was saving for the end and just say it here. If I was talking about an overall story grade for Genshin, then I would have to give Fontaine a mid-grading. That being said, I would pass Fontaine with flying colors, provided a caveat. You don't look at it as a part of the overall quest to Genshin Impact. Instead, you look at it from the perspective that this is actually character quests for Linny, Navia, and Farina. Because some of the best stories are just about characters. Hey guys, we're at the halfway point. If you liked anything you've heard, hit that like and subscribe button. I'm on the road to 10k subs. Oh, also, I've got a Patreon if you want more from me. Back to the video. Upon finishing their sentence, the traveler heads to Poisson, the headquarters of the Spina di Rasula. After learning that the water levels have risen and some parts of the Primordial Sea have leaked out into the world. Once we get there, it's desperate. The few people that have remained are broken or are hiding on top of their houses, too frightened to even move. The traveler finally finds Navia, giving out orders atop one of the higher levels. However, her two retainers, Malus and Silver, who have always been by her side, are nowhere to be found. After giving a few more orders, we are able to leave with Navia to visit her father's grave. She breaks down and tells us what we already know. Malus and Silver are now gone. They had been swept away by the Primordial Sea. There were moments in the Fortress of Meripede that were unbelievably slow. However, here, it's appropriate. The fact that we've slowed down and have taken the time to let this all sink in? That's great! From the voice actor actress's performance to Louis Sur Leville playing in the background. Its notes usually melancholy and calm, but now are filled with sorrow and loneliness. I do wish that this had been a cutscene on screen though, instead of them being killed off screen. In the midst of all this, our Lakino approaches us with information regarding the prophecy. She says that a few of her informants have found some ruins that may relate to the prophecy, and says that if we want any more information, we should investigate them. The Traveler, Paimon, and Navia make their way to the ruins and while exploring, Navia falls into the Primordial Sea. But she doesn't dissolve. Navia is rescued by the remnants of Melus and Silver with the assistance of Nouvellet, who joins us on our journey. Together we find three stone tablets that foretell the prophecy. Although, there is a fourth that is completely destroyed. After deciphering as much as we can, the group disbands and we end up burning into Mona at Poisson and try enlisting the help of her to decipher the prophecy. 
Mona says that she is unable, however her master is far more capable, and might be able to help us in our search. In the meantime, Nouvellette confronts Farina about what she knows. And Farina, as always, dodges the question. But you could tell she's racked with guilt when Nouvellette hands her the list of names that have died at Poisson. Farina storms out of the office, and the Traveler meets with Nouvellette to finally set a trap for the Hydro Archon. And so, the trial of Farina begins, and the plot twist is revealed. Farina has never been the Hydro Archon. Alright, that's a pretty good plot twist. Throughout this whole quest, it's been slowly built upon that Farina doesn't really have the power of an Archon. Add to the fact, there were also moments of Farina's character being called into question. Moments where she would hesitate and be unsure of something. As if to not know something, she obviously should. Because, as it turns out, Ruka Devata has been hiding in the Ortrys the entire time. She's been gathering up energy to erase the effects of Elazar, leaving behind her successor amidst her sacrifice. Whoops, that's the wrong Archon! Sorry about that, guys. What I meant to say was Fosalor has been hiding away in the Ortrys to gather up Endemnidium so she can execute herself and hand over her divine power to Nouvellet. Yeah, that's kind of a big problem. These two plot lines are too similar and too close together. I suppose you could argue that they're not exactly the same, that they do have their differences. But as mentioned before, these main story quests are back to back, ending in a similar fashion. It's too similar. Most of us don't realize it because these quests happened a year apart, so you can't be bothered to remember what happened a year ago. As much as I'd like to give credit for having this emotional moment behind this quest, I simply cannot. Because, as much as I feel for Farina, she's not the one who dies here. That's Fosalor. I'm supposed to believe this big emotional moment for a character I've only just met. Hydro Dragon, Hydro Dragon, don't cry. Why, why would he cry? I call into question if he even knows you. Remember, I gave credit where credit was due with Navia and her emotional moment because I genuinely felt that they took time out of the story to let it breathe and have weight. How do the people react to Farina once she takes her leave? How does Nouvellet feel knowing that she's kept the secret from him all this time? Boy, I can't wait for these answers and the story to flesh itself out and these big emotional moments to happen. But we aren't allowed this time. We don't have time for any of that because, well, one of the biggest problems of Fontaine is that there's too much going on. How about we give you some more backstory on Fosalor and Egeria? No? How about we spend two hours building up a boat? How about we spend the time building up the court system and how it's unjustified for Fontanians? Nope. Let's spend time building up a murder mystery instead. Don't get me wrong, this story works when it's about characters. And yeah, I still have problems with Farina's story, but overall, I'd say it's pretty good. But what about the main story? Yes, the prophecy is a plot thread that's layered throughout the entire arc, but I feel it's slightly hindered by everything else. And at the end of it all, nothing really changes. Yes, they lost their energy source, but Nouvellet said he would try to maintain it. Well, the Hydro Archon doesn't exist anymore. Yeah, you're right. But that doesn't stop YouTubers and Genshin players from calling Farina the Hydro Archon. Farina is the Hydro Archon. Farina, the Hydro Archon. The Hydro Archon is the best character. Great unit already, right? She's an Archon. As well as the game's promotional art. Despite the fact that the last arc was to prove that she actually wasn't the Archon. I would like to charge you as a fraud who's never been the Archon in the first place. Does anybody really pay attention to this story anymore? And speaking of the Hydro Archon, does it even matter that she executed herself? Nothing happens as a result of this. I could forgive the Archon quest to Fontaine if the Heavenly Principles actually bothered to show up, but nothing happens. But Greenline, the Heavenly Principles are asleep! I know, but nothing in this story so far feels like it's been building to anything. Well, except for you. Yeah, I should probably address that, shouldn't I? Once a year, we are given pieces of a story called We Will Be Reunited. The first time any of us played through the prelude quest, we were met with awe and wonder at the introduction to a character named Dainsleth. This man was first introduced to us during the Tavat chapter storyline preview, and I'm sure most of us thought, wow, that guy looks cool. He's definitely an interesting character when we first meet him. The way he talks, it seems that he's not fond of this world of Tavat, and he is especially not fond of the gods that govern it. 
Dainsliff is searching for an Abyss Herald, something we had yet to come across in our journeys up until that point. And so we journey with Dane to find the Abyss Herald, sadly to no avail. However, something does happen once we reach the end with him. We come across a large footprint left by a ruined guard, and then we have this bizarre vision of certain events that we've had with our sibling, as if to signify there's some loose connection there. But then sadly the quest ends and Dainsliff takes his leave. The next time we see Dane is when we're taking on a commission for the Adventurers Guild. There seems to be a problem with the treasure hoarders and the Abyss might be involved. Following this information, we finally run into the Abyss Herald, the one that Dane has been chasing. He escapes and shortly after we run into Dane'sliff again. Together we follow the trail left by the Herald. At the end of the road, we finally defeat the Herald, only for our sibling to enter the fray. The Traveler is left stunned, and our sibling tells us to continue our journey. As they leave with the Herald, and Dane'sliff follows close behind as the rift they entered closes, leaving both the Traveler and Paimon behind. I think Dainsliff worked as a plot device up to this point. He entered the story briefly and then left as quickly as he came, leaving only theories behind as to what his true nature could be. After the second quest though, I don't think this applies. After this point, the Traveler is aware that Dainsliff knows our sibling and traveled with them. From this point on, we should be asking Dane everything he knows about our sibling, Conria, as well as the Abyss. What's funny is that the game makes you believe Dainsliff is actually answering our questions, but in actuality, he's just stating what we already know. The story refuses to answer any of its posing questions. What happened 500 years ago? How long did you travel together? What did the two of them find during their journey? What is my sibling expecting me to find at the end of the journey? These are questions any sane person would have, and it's at this point in the story that we have no excuse not to stick by Dane's side. I only hope that next time we meet, you know whose side you're on. <sighs> okay, I need to make something clear. I know I've been nitpicky with certain things about this game. However, this is downright stupid. There is no reason, none whatsoever, why the Traveler shouldn't follow Dane. This is the game stretching out its story to the point that it breaks immersion. What is the driving force behind our main character? To find our sibling and reunite with them. Letting Dane's lift go at this point in the story conflicts with that goal. It'd be like if Naruto decided not to become Okage simply because Sasuke said that he was going to be. That wouldn't make any sense. Finally, I want to talk about bedtime story. The latest quest we've been given so far. For the first time, I thought I was finally going to be proven wrong when the story was going to take a huge leap in its narrative and finally reveal the truth about this world. We get to sit down with our sibling for a moment at the end and finally talk. And this happens. There's so much I wanted to ask you, but for some reason, I'm not interested in asking those questions right now. <laughs> They're not even trying to hide it at this point. For some random reason, I don't feel like asking questions to my sibling that could possibly help me get closer to my goal. No, instead, I'm just going to sit here and stare at the sunset. I'd be more forgiving if there was an actual reason why we couldn't ask any of these questions. And this, this specifically, is the main problem I have with Genshin Impact Story overall. It wastes my time. Look, let me give you an example. Have you guys played Kingdom Hearts 3? One of the main criticisms lobbied at this game is that it's 80% filler and only takes up 20% to get to the actual story. For several hours, it meanders throughout the Disney worlds and just fills in random events. Only then, towards the end, does it finally get the plot moving. That's what Genshin feels like most of the time. It feels like it only has 5 or 10% relevant story plots. You have to be patient, Green Line. What were you expecting from this game? Well, I guess I'll tell you. During the first video, I called Liwe Peak. Here's why. Liwe's story quest felt connected, and it felt like it led up to something. From our meeting with Tartaglia to our introduction with Zhang Li, then fighting Tartaglia in the Golden House. Some of it was rather slow, true, but it all felt connected and all culminated in the climax with the fight with Osile. 
add to the fact that Zhang Li's story quest added some more lore and backstory to his character that may have hinted at some hidden history. It may not matter now, but it mattered back then. This idea that there was all this lore and mystery to all these stories, and they were all going to be fleshed out, and they were all going to eventually lead to the finale with Conria. Inazuma was going to tell us more, and then when we made it to Sumeru, that was going to tell us even more. You know, with Sumeru being the home of the God of Wisdom. As it stands, what do we know after four years? Remember what I said at the start of this video? That we were at the halfway point? So what do we have to show for it? When you reveal certain mysteries, that doesn't mean they're necessarily over. That can just lead into more stuff that you can build upon. At the end of Fontaine, we run into Skirk, and that calls into question even more. But that's all it is nowadays. A J.J. Abrams mystery box. But you need to have answers to these mysteries, and simply not add more. Look, this video's gone on long enough. I'll just leave you with one more thing. I'm gonna let Gabriel Iglesias explain just how I feel about Genshin's story versus its lore. Because on paper! Having the world be made of elemental energy is exactly the same as having it be made up of memories. When Nahida stayed that our twin belongs to Tevats, this then forced the Traveler to start questioning their own memories. Perinary is a story about one such outlander who traversed the fire of two worlds and was reborn. It says he's a genius, but at home? <laughs> that's right! It doesn't match! And that's basically how I feel. I feel like the lore of Genshin Impact is one thing entirely, but the story, the story does not match. The story is slow, the story is boring, and I just don't care anymore. But until next time, guys.